Hi everyone, I'm Mike Henry, and this is my Procreate 4.3 demo for the piece I call Recharge. So as I said, I wanted to start getting away from the turpentine brush uh, stuff just to, you know, diversify, have fun doing different things. Uh, and while I was watching E3, of course, like Cyberpunk was on. Um, I'm actually not that super hyped about it, but there was something about that being on in conjunction with me showing my son some like old anime. And then it was like, you know, I don't actually emphasize the anime side of my influence as much anymore. And that's kind of like all I used to do is like when I was like in high school, like draw, you know, pictures of like Matoko Kusanagi and draw pictures of like Gali and like all that kind of stuff. Just going down that that anime rabbit hole that was so awesome in the late 90s. Um, so anyways, that's kind of what I wanted to do here. And then it ended up being super cyberpunky. So I, I can't, you know, logically deny the fact that. Um, it didn't influence me. It was probably on screen um, either while I started this or a little bit before so the idea here was not actually to do something that was Kind of like in that vein although I stumbled onto it It was more to do something in the vein of like anime uh, that that influenced me when I was younger uh, And still does but it just doesn't show up in my work that much. So what you see here is a technique I've used in the past when I want to do something that's like super zoomed in. Uh, I start by doing a sketch of more than what I'm going to need and then I like frame it like you see here. So that way I can work on making sure that like the general anatomy and the general proportions are all what I want them to be. Then, um, and, and this box is done using the uh, size of the actual canvas, or excuse me, the uh, aspect ratio of the actual canvas. That way when I'm done I could just sort of blow it up and it'll fit. So what you see right now is um, the dimensions of the canvas and then I filled it black. I shrunk that, that square down to what I wanted it to frame and then I filled the opposite of that in black and then lowered the opacity on that just so I could see the whole thing. If you're wondering like what the actual trick is to do that um, little thing. So uh, now we've got this little canvas that I'm working within, this canvas within a canvas uh, and then that way I can, as I said, make sure the anatomy and proportions are okay. I can draw beyond it and make sure everything is uh, looking like it should. And then in a second I'll make that framing pure black so that I can actually see if I like the picture that I'm going to end up with. So there we go, and I see, okay, yep, this communicates everything that I want. So then I just blow that up, and it's low quality, doesn't matter, because it has nothing to do with the final image. I'm going to be applying uh, fresh lines at the proper resolution uh, to uh, finish the piece. So that's that's just the way, you know, in in not in Procreate, this is a way that I work a lot more often uh, and I do it a lot with uh, smart objects where I will do a rough sketch and then I'll just shrink it really small as a smart object and stick it in the corner and then do another rough sketch and do the same thing and the same thing and then I have like a lot of options. I usually don't do that for uh, most of my illustrations because uh, most of my illustration work that you see here is in client based so I'm just kind of doing what I want. But if I wanted to provide a bunch of options to a client that's a good way to do it. Or if I'm working in a concept art environment and I would need to design a character or design a vehicle or something like that, I'll do a bunch of those roughs, shrink them like that, and then when I actually want to start figuring them out I can go into that smart object do my detailing or do the next step or whatever it is so it works out uh, pretty well procreate doesn't have smart objects because of various limitations uh, so we just find other ways to do it in this case it was pretty simple however I would also do something like what we just saw as multiple layers at full res and save them in multiple uh, files and then like import them into something later just, you know, the, the, the real point that I am not explaining but I'm sort of dancing around is at the end of the day we have like similar process to develop things visually and so you're just trying to find the workaround so that you're doing the same core thing, which in this case is a base sketch that's at the right proportion that you want or at the right size or the right framing or whatever it is and then you want to preserve that for when you're going into the next stage. Something that I specifically did as a shout out to my younger self in this piece was that the way the shadow is on that nose. Um, obviously I have a little bit more anatomy going on on the lit side than I would have when I was younger, but that's like that's like me trying to find some sort of a happy medium, bet medium between like an old, old style anime nose and then like what I do today. I just kind of thought it'd be fun because when I was in high school I used to do that like, you know, that little 
diamond-like uh, anime shadow nose all the time, not really even understanding what that was, and I thought it'd be kind of nice to sort of bring that back in some way. And I'm trying to keep all the lines in here like pretty obvious with the shading. That way it kind of looks like the old mangas that I used to read all the time when I had time to do that kind of thing. But let's take a pause for a minute here. And let's uh, talk, let's do a fat pencil recap for a minute. I was recently in a conversation with somebody on Instagram where he was saying that he wasn't getting um, what he wanted out of the fat pencil uh, based on what he had seen in my drawings. And I've, I've had other people say this thing and I didn't really understand it, but he and I went back and forth with a couple of videos to sort of explain the problem, and I think I finally figured it out. The issue is that when people see my lines um, in the final piece, they don't see this pixelation that you're seeing right here. And then when you're using the fat pencil, you're seeing this pixelation. The thing is though, is that I don't just draw a sing oh and by the way, here's the resolution of the canvas so that everybody can be on the same page about, you know, the, all the right sizes and everything. The thing is, I don't use the fat pencil and just do like a single stroke like that. I'm not pulling like a Hirschfeld or anything where it's just like this one flowy thing or this one perfect line that's just laid down. Um, as you can see here, I build the line. Uh, that's the way I've drawn whenever I'm trying to achieve something that's not a sketch or not a single sort of contour thing. Um, when I'm trying to actually get that line quality that I'm looking for, I build the line exactly how I want it to. So here's like a really rough sketch, lower the opacity. And then I'll start just drawing, I mean this is incredibly rudimentary, but this way you can at least see that the line doesn't just lay down and it's exactly the way it, I want it in one stroke. I do this right here. And so it can either be I'm stroke, stroke, stroke to build it up, or it can be that I sort of like trap the shape of the line that I want and then fill it in. A second ago on that like hard cheek line, that's what I did. Here this is more of like a building up. And then when I want to do something that's just like a really light line, it's that is just a drawn line usually. So depending on what I'm working with, I'll handle this differently. If I'm using more of like an ink brush or something uh, that has like a lot of thick, thin play with the pressure, that I'll do in just like a stroke. But not when I'm doing this type of stuff with a tool like the fat pencil. Because when I was a kid, all I ever drew with was like a 2B pencil. Um, so I just had to come up with like methods to get the look that I wanted and it's always just stuck with me. Here's some off screen capture just so that you can see exactly what it looks like. Uh, which by the way, I've gotten a lot of requests to do more of this kind of stuff and I absolutely will. I'm nearly to the point to where I can start doing more advanced setups, but we'll, we'll, you'll see when I finally get to it. I'm going to stop promising it and eventually you're just going to see it. But you can see my awesome lazy camera work here with no tripod. This is me just trying to capture real quick so you, everybody can see. So that is how I do that. And that's why you see maybe a more precision to the line than what you're getting when you use the fat pencil if you don't think that I'm building the line like that. So I hope that helps some folks out there who have been struggling with that um, because I was going back and forth with people occasionally where they were saying, yeah, the fat pencil doesn't look like your fat pencil. And so I think that it's come down to, it's not the settings because I made the video, the settings are all the same, everybody's got the same settings. I think it's more about the actual application, the way that I'm using it, and that might not be clear to everyone. So now we are just moving through the image and doing the tight lines. Now I, I say that it's not quite that simple on this one because since I took something that was small and really sketchy and blew it up, there's like a lot of room to define what's happening here. So it's not just so much like this flat out execution, um, I'm also making more decisions than normal in this, like, you, like when I'm deciding right there how that screw's going to be in there, um, or how I'm deciding on like the details of the kind of like stretchy biomechanical looking stuff that's sort of in the connective tissue between the big plates as well as like the details around the connectors and things like that. There are also aspects that I just flat out change when we get to them, so uh, I'll comment on that when we get there. So now here's just some more cast shadow stuff. I wanted, as I said, I was trying to um, evoke some of the uh, manga that I used to read. Uh, I Basically I don't read manga anymore just because I don't have time. I'm either drawing at work with my kids, something like that, 
um, and the idea of having some solitary moments where I can actually read something, or I'm practicing Spanish, one, you know, something like that. So I don't really have the um, time to read that much, but I've been considering going back and just making some time for like a, cute, a few key series that I uh, absolutely love like Maze on Ikoku or Blade of the Immortal. Um, those are some ones that I've always just absolutely loved. And I used to reread Maze on Ikoku once a year, but I just don't have uh, any time for that anymore. Wah wah. But that's one of... Uh, let's talk about that for a second while we watch the lines go down. Um, a lot of you have asked in the past for some of my influences. And in the Q&A that I did, I um, mentioned a few of my influences. And so I think over the years my tastes as as they do or I shouldn't say my taste but my my willingness to be influenced by broader things has increased um so like you might see some of my more rendered stuff and compare it to this artist or that artist but a, the, the interesting thing I think is that my foundation for what I got most excited about in my formative art years were things like Hiroaki Samura and Kenichi Sonoda and Rumiko Takahashi and of course Joe Mad. There's lots of Joe Mad influence in my work. Um, and but th that manga, that era of manga that was like the early 90s to the late 90s or the early 90s to the early 2000s um, that had like a huge impact uh, on me in general so if you sort of take all of that that's that's from the manga side from the anime side it's things like giant robo and of course cowboy bebop everybody loves cowboy bebop and samurai champ blue and um, but even like the older stuff like black magic and um, See what's in it. I mean, Ghost in the Shell, Ninja Scroll, like all the classic stuff that was released by manga, all the classic stuff that was released by uh, ADV. Like all of that is sort of my foundation. It's it's when I feel like even though I loved art and I was basically an artist since I was as little as possible, um, and I was always influenced by like American comic books and American cartoons and all the things that looked like American cartoons but were actually done by like Japanese studios and things like that. Um, all of that eventually resulted in anime hitting at sort of like the right influence time for me, and that's when it just like for me everything like took off and I and I got even more obsessed than I previously was spending what little money I had on manga and on like VHS tapes at Suncoast video of like the most expensive <laughs> the most expensive things possible um, I was recently commiserating with a co-worker um, about the idea of spending like $30 for two episodes on a VHS tape and that those VHS tapes were released like one after the other over the course of like months and you wouldn't know when the next one was going to come out and so by the time you got like a full series like Cowboy Bebop you were like a small fortune invested in the series um, but that was everything to uh, me and a lot of my friends uh, trying to collect that stuff and getting influenced by that stuff and then so after like a good stint of being impacted by that uh, I said it before but I'll, I'll stress it like Romiko Takahashi's work, specifically on Meizani Koku, a little bit on Inuyasha, and a little bit on Ren Mahaf, um, and then uh, Hiroaki Samura's work, like, those were some of the biggest influences, um, as well as Kenichi Sonoda, because Gunsmith Cats is, like, amazing, and I will always love Gunsmith Cats, so, like, those were sort of, like, these uh, building blocks, and, of course, you know, Ghost in the Shell and the other ones that I mentioned, and so after absorbing all of that, and sort of putting it through my filter, my sort of teenage filter, and, and spitting it out the other end, combining it with a little bit of comic book uh, in influence, American comic book influence. Uh, then I got into college, and in college I was sort of exposed to a lot more things, not like in like a, a completely mind-blown, like, oh my god, all these things exist kind of way, but more like... Uh, yeah, you got to sit down and do some 3D modeling. You got to do some 3D animation. This is going to be starting to go more of like the Pixar route or the just sort of 3D feature film animation route. Uh, and then that started to seep in there. And then concept artists from that world started to seep in there and video games. And then all this stuff sort of jammed together. And that's something that people ask me when they're talking about style. Like, how did you get your style? You don't really, I mean, this has been explained by a million artists, so I don't think I'm saying anything that's that's totally fresh, but I think that it's worth saying is that you don't really pick your style. You can pick a style, but that's sort of a disingenuous way to get to something unique. Instead, the idea is more to just 
absorb, 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 and draw, draw, draw. And over time, you're going to be incorporating various things. You're going to also be making errors, and you're going to be making up for those errors with different techniques or different stylizations. And sort of stylization is like the coming together of like influence and errors and problem solving and the way that you decide something's going to get represented and then it all comes together and it's like this is a look and, and that's what people then respond to is that uh, these are a bunch of sort of natural conclusions that you've come to as an artist that you've built up and that you then start executing on a regular basis because once you sort of have a tool in your tool belt you kind of keep pulling it out and using it unless you decide to deliberately go back and uh, re-engineer some aspect of your uh, your skill set, your interpretation, and and that is your style. That is what people start responding to the repetition of those quirks, basically. Um, and so when you hear about my influences and you see me going from uh, like as a kid, like it was all comic books and Ninja Turtles, and then going into like teenager where it's like all anime all the time. Um, actually that was from like middle school through high school and beyond and then in college getting influenced by animation and video game concept art and then of course getting my first jobs in the industry where you have to you know it goes back to that old thing where it's like those people who draw anime like constantly and they find it hard to get work like you're gonna find it hard to get work if you only can do one thing all the time it's not about it being anime or not it's about you not having the flexibility um, for somebody to be interested in your art because at the end of the day then now I'm getting a little bit on a uh, rant but at the end of the day for you to get a job somewhere first the company needs to hire somebody like you and then you need to make yourself visible, and then you need to be good enough. And the, when I say that they need to want to hire somebody like you, it's that the project that they're working on has to need you. And if the project that they're working on needs something that looks like Disney, or something that looks like Call of Duty, or something that looks like uh, your fav insert favorite manga or whatever, like those people, the people who do that are going to get that job. The other people who are going to get that job are people who can do all of it anyways because they just have like core skills and they know how to adapt to different styles. So that sort of just wraps up like a huge rant that kind of covered a number of things, but I think the important things uh, to just sort of bucket all of that was like, those are my influences and that's how you get to style and the the way you get a job is you have to be known there has to be a need for you you have to be known and you have to uh deliver and by the way i just want to stress when i say be known i don't mean be famous because most of the people who work in the industry who do really cool stuff they're not famous at all they what i mean by be known is have a linkedin page apply to jobs uh, get in people's face, I don't mean that in an aggressive way, get in people's sort of vision so that they know you exist and that that way when they're looking for people to fill positions, they know, um, they remember you and they go, oh yeah, okay, that person, I remember talking to that person uh, two years ago and they'd be perfect for this. And so that's, that's what you're looking to do. Man, I feel like I just dumped, like brain dumped on you guys. So hopefully any, hopefully that was valuable. This is kind of a long drawing process, so I didn't want to just discuss the drawing, uh, but uh, yeah, hopefully that was valuable. So let's uh, talk about what's been achieved so far in the piece. We've got most of the drawing done. We've got most of the details done. We've added the details into the sort of tubing and wiring. Um, the sort of key when you're doing something like this, or at least in my mind, it obviously depends on the style, but the key to doing something like this, the thing that I think is always fun, is combining these big bold shapes like the metal plating, technically like her skin and face, her hair, her shirt. Um, these are sort of like bigger shapes, and then you've got like all this like condensed detail. And that contrast in the detail frequency is uh, really fun to look at. So you've got this like weird little embellishment that's like in this sort of hole slot in her arm. You've got the tight ribbing of the that sort of connective material there um, with the other little detail on that ribbing so that it just sort of adds like even more uh, detailed density. 
Then you've got the connectors that have smaller details. Uh, and then uh, we're coming up on some embellishments on her forearm that are going to also have finer details. And then lastly, uh, when we're done with the line stuff, I go in and I put some like codes across the entire thing that sort of look like little stamps of like manufacturer stuff or serial numbers for some purpose. And that all just adds into that, that contrast of detail, uh, which is, I think, sort of the, the fun of doing something like this. Now something that's going to be coming up I want to talk about real quick. I use the text tool in here to start laying in some of that text, not 100% of it, but some of it. And I want to point out that I use the text tool, but then I don't use the text as it is raw because the look of this piece is that it is an illustration. It is obviously drawn with pencil. And then if we put in something really cold um, and really precise, like a, an actual font, it might not look good. It might look kind of like this artificial stamp on it which obviously isn't what we're looking for, right? Um, so I use the font to lay in the font where I want it, but then I draw over it so that I can start making it look like it's a little bit more handcrafted like the rest of the illustration. And that's what I do across all of the fonts in this piece. So right now we're just doing these uh, plugs, these sort of heavy plugs that are on her arm using the ellipses tool that they have in uh, Procreate, which is awesome. And then duplicating it because in duplicating it, it's going to keep a sort of machined look because things are going to look repetitive. The thing that won't look repetitive is things like scratches and nicks. So after doing the sort of pristine version, we duplicate it over and then go in and mess them up individually a little bit so that they look uh, like even though they were manufactured the same, they are different because of the, the life they've lived, so to speak. And then also just to sort of create a little bit of more of a natural feel, we're going to have a plug going into one but not going into the other just because, you know, some sort of logic that makes sense, but, but we're not aware of what that is. Okay, adjusting some of the shadow um, on the shirt. Uh, there was some cast shadow aspects of those like sort of rippled parts of her tank top that looked like off and even though if they were right and I'm not entirely sure that they were right it was too distracting so I just sort of changed it and took some artistic liberties there. So with a piece like this it's actually kind of similar to my A Village Corrupted stuff because there's no painted shadows in here when we get to the color phase. So we the, the bulk of the work is in the lines and then when we get to the flats it's just laying in flats super fast making sure all the colors and the values and stuff are what we want them to be and and then the piece kind of gets done really fast so the heavy lifting on this is all in the lines and speaking of lines here's that part I was talking about where we use a font uh, type it out warp it the way we want it and then uh, draw over it in order to give it a little bit more of a hand created look uh, it's still going to be pretty precise compared to the rest of the illustration because it is a font and it is based on a font. Um, but that that might actually uh, help us because in the real world, something like hair or face or body or eyes or whatever would would have more organic quirks, and a font obviously won't because it's it's man-made and stuff. So now we've done that, we've got the lines, I'm going to go in and probably do a little bit more touches, and then we'll eliminate the original font from that. Um, although at the end, I believe what I do is I bring the font back in and merge it all together so that it still looks a little handmade, but then it's a solid font instead of being colored in. Um, like, like how it is now where it's like lines with space in the middle. Here we're doing some more serials. By the way, all the serial codes throughout this entire thing are all actual they have actual meaning not meaning like in her world but they're all like combinations of like m members of my family and important dates and things like that so um it was kind of fun to do it that way so i could hide some extra meaning in there for me and stuff uh and it also kind of helps to make things look a little bit more deliberate when you're not just making up rando numbers but you're actually in letters but you're actually combining some stuff it, it makes it look more like the way uh some sort of manufacturer's code could be actually this is the simplistic part where we're just going in and filling in flats. Uh, the flat stack 
is more or less what you're going to see uh, get put in here. Oh, here, I'm just correcting some eye stuff real quick. Um, it's more or less the order that you're going to see here. The skin is almost all the way on the back layer, but it, it certainly starts on the back layer. I then throw those tubes on the backmost layer because it just makes more sense to do it that way. There they go in right there. Um, and then uh, the arm goes on top of the skin, but it's under the hair. So just, you know, some logic, logic things like logical uh, layer placements like that. And now here's some of that connective tissue. I wanted it to kind of be this like red color. I mean, I think it's been that type of a color in past sort of sci-fi things before. It's not, you know, brand new, but I like the fact that it kind of hints at the idea of muscle. Um, so that's cool. And then we're just trying to find some uh, good ways to differentiate some of these metal pieces. I wanted the outer shell of the arm to be potentially metal or at the very least some sort of material that could be you know strong like metal um so that's why it's got a little bit of a warm uh gray to it it's it's not i don't think it's desaturated enough to really be a gray but it, it kind of could be and then the parts that are sort of more raw metal um, are grayer and then various amounts of uh, value there in order to uh, really make that those pieces feel more like they're part of the inner guts or the actual more mechanical nature of it instead of this exterior shell. So there now the uh, the Arma, that Arma-HE sort of serial is done. Uh, going in and adding a few little details, like you can see the little pink arrow which later gets changed to yellow that's pointing at that snap and then there's like another one that's pointing sort of off of that, that weird sort of over the shoulder piece that's there. Now adding in just a little bit of uh, highlighting, weathering and stuff. It's really trying, I'm really trying to be limited in what I do here. I want to sell the materials, but the premise of this is that it's all done with like very simplistic flats. So you can see we've got some variation in the skin tones. We've got some highlights for the metal. Oh, and then here's the decimal pattern. A lot of people were asking about this. Uh, there's a brush in the texture section called decimal, and that's how I did that. So now what we've done is we've taken all the flats and merged them and we're lowering the opacity, we're adjusting the, the opacity of those flats and that's how we get this look where we're absorbing that pink background. Uh, then I duplicate the lines and make them purple and lower the opacity on those. I put a dirty paper texture over the entire thing and then I duplicate that dirty paper texture and stick it in the back so that I can emphasize the texture in that pink field back there and make it a little bit reduced on her actual figure. Uh, now we're just throwing in some darkening uh, where some of those divots in her metal are uh, or in her just whatever that material is. Um, that way we can just emphasize that damage a little bit more. And then I had this idea to, to throw a bracelet on her pretty early into the piece and then I totally forgot about it. Uh, so this is going back to that thing I mentioned where I say that I let the piece sit before I post it. I like completed it and then I threw it on my phone. Sometimes I'll do something like I'll throw it on my phone as a wallpaper so I'm forced to look at it all the time. And then I was like, oh shit, I forgot about the bracelet. So I came back in and added the bracelet and I was trying to think of a fun little thing to put on the bracelet to hint at some of these like anime roots and I couldn't think of a, like a really good symbol for some of the stuff that this was more directly inspired by like Ghost in the Shell or Battle Angel or something like that. Uh, so I just went with the Shizuma Drive because uh, Giant Robo is the greatest anime of all time and I don't care what anybody says. So I also wanted to uh, change the Shizuma Drive. The Shizuma Drive has metal caps on each end with a red ball floating in the middle and when I get to the flats for that you'll see that I try to class it up a little. I try to make it look like it may have been like a, a bit of slightly expensive jewelry. So as I said I wanted to keep the flats simple but I wanted to sell certain materials so I do go in and add a little bit of shine into the hair just like into the metal. Uh, I just thought that it'd be really nice uh, to, to just sell that a little bit more. See here we make the Shizuma Drive gold and put like a little crystal in the middle instead of a red ball just to make it look like it's kind of a fancier interpretation of it. And now here I had to redo the line, making the lines purple because I went back and adjusted things like that, adding that bracelet. Uh, here's the extra texture in the background. And now we've reached the end of the piece. 
So the key things that I want to emphasize with this is that it is line driven, uh, the flats are very simplistic, and then it uses textures to try and add some extra visual interest to the entire thing. There's damaged paper textures for the whole thing, there's enhanced damaged paper textures for the background, and then there's this decimal texture going across her whole figure, which gives it a little bit of this like darkened in shadow sort of look, uh, as well as in emphasizing more texture there uh, to really kind of sell it. I'll do a slower sweep than normal so you can see that texture and how it all plays together. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, we're back to doing some heavy line stuff, so I think I, I think uh, fans of that will, will dig this and some of the future pieces. And uh, I'll see you on the next video. And if you're looking for me on the internet, these are the places where you can find me.